I'm Andrea Delzato, and welcome to Leadership Updates and Dialogues. We are thrilled today to have the Honorable Minister of Labor, Training, and Skills Development, Monty McNaughton. Welcome, Minister McNaughton. Hi, Andrea. Great to be with you. Thank you. I think the last time we saw each other was at our Built for Respect campaign kickoff in November last year. So how have you been since then? Busy, I imagine. <laughs> Absolutely uh, swamped, but I have to tell you, uh, I will never forget uh, that event uh, at George Brown College uh, that day. Uh, I think I was fairly new to the uh, training uh, portfolio, and it was great just to see um, all of the work being done there. And of course, um, the Angelo Del Zotto uh, School of Construction. So what a legacy. Ah, oh, that's right. I remember that, and uh, all the all the workers working with their hands, which uh, we don't see enough of, actually. So it was great to be there together. I remember that. Um, before we start, I wanted to point out something that I thought was pretty interesting. I did a little bit of digging. Hope you don't mind. And I found out that we have a couple things in common. So, both have a background and a start in family businesses, and we both were inspired by grandfather's name, Jack which I thought was really interesting. So I wanted to know if you could share a little bit of that background from your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. What a, uh, what a small world. So my uh, grandfather, Jack, um, whom I never met, he passed away actually uh, about five years before I was born. Mm -hmm. uh, but reading about him from a, a really young age got me interested uh, in politics. And he spent uh, literally two decades uh, before he passed away uh, getting a hospital started in the small town of Newbury, uh, where I'm from. Um, my dad ended up uh, uh, buying out uh, the business, which was a home hardware building center. So I got my start at a very young age working in the family business. Mm, very interesting. And your career in public service, was, was that your passion? Is that, you know, how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, I really had an interest, as I said, from a, a very young age, reading about uh, my grandfather, who was the local Reeve. That's what they called mayors back then. Uh, the local Reeve for uh, I think about 30 years. He built this hospital, was also an entrepreneur, had a number of uh, small businesses uh, in the village and that really just piqued my interest. I, I remember I was in grade six uh, reading about him and and just this passion was lit uh, inside of me and uh, you know I was involved in students council. I got elected on uh, village council when I was uh, 20 while I was working uh, in our family business and and the rest is history as they say. I think that's really, it's really, um, it's a gift to know where you want to be at such a young age and where you're headed. So that's a great story. Um, you're definitely in an interesting time right now as we are, um, you know, we talked about the anti-racism campaign. We're in the midst of a pandemic still. So I really appreciate the time you're taking today. And I thought we could start with as Minister of Labor, Training and Skills Development, what are the main areas of responsibility that fall under your domain, so to speak? Well, certainly it is a, a very, very uh, challenging and, and difficult time for literally uh, everyone. I think of those frontline healthcare heroes. Uh, think of all those construction workers, those women and men working every single day, building uh, all of those uh, critical infrastructure projects that uh, families uh, depend on. Um, for us uh, at the ministry, it's been a, a challenging year, a very busy year. I mean, we are obviously responsible for health and safety. That's my number one priority. Uh, every you know man and woman going to work every day deserves to come home safely uh, after a hard day's work. Uh, we also uh, ensure when we're talking about health and safety on jobs that uh, workplaces are free from racism and discrimination and hate. I mean, that's legislated. And then lastly, uh, a real focus on uh, training, retraining, upskilling, uh, getting more young people uh, into the skilled trades. That's certainly uh, my mission. Great. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in detail a little bit later. Um, I wanted to also talk about the relationship and the extended relationship of, you know, labor and specifically an employee and how that impacts families and the greater communities. I know you spend an awful lot of time talking about that and the impact that um, labor has on our communities. Well, certainly, I mean, uh, I believe uh, strongly and, and passionately that uh, good, meaningful jobs uh, strengthen all of our families and, and build better communities. Uh, one of the things uh, our government recently announced was a uh, community uh, building fund, uh, just over $100 million that's going to go out there and support all of those nonprofit organizations um, I, I think locally in the communities that I represent, we have lots of uh, museums, 
uh, sports and recreation uh, organizations, uh, different uh, arts and culture uh, attractions. Uh, so that $105 million is going to go a long ways into building uh, better communities, literally everywhere uh, in Ontario. Yeah, I, when I read about that, I thought it was absolutely wonderful. And it took me to thinking about all the pillars of building community. And arts and culture have definitely been one that we have missed tremendously over the past year, I think all of us. And in your previous role, I noted as Minister of Infrastructure, you were actually very fundamental in preserving what is one of our foundational arts and culture uh, monuments, which is Massey Hall. And you were critical in, in restoring that. So I know you share that with many, many people. And can you talk a little bit more about other investments made in infrastructure? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that um, Massey Hall uh, refurb and, and improvements, uh, what a legacy uh, for for many, many people and, and generations of people. And it's played such a vital role uh, here in Toronto and literally across uh, Canada. Um, I did spend the first year as Minister of Infrastructure uh, under Premier Ford. Um, I would say a, a number of uh, just critical things uh, apart from the Massey Hall investment, uh, the broadband, I mean, getting high speed broadband to families, um, even just outside of the GTA, there's many areas in, for example, like Pickering where we need that investment, the Halton region, uh, but there's so many uh, underserved communities across the province. Uh, yes. So that's a, a critical piece. And I, I really believe that that levels uh, the province up. Um, so everyone's uh, competitive and can really share in uh, the uh, economic growth of the province. Uh, yeah. Secondly, um, we did invest heavily and we are invest heavily, investing heavily uh, $30 billion in the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. That's a partnership between the federal government of the province of Ontario and local municipalities to build you know, roads and bridges and uh, green uh, infrastructure, uh, wastewater. I mean, just really important uh, infrastructure projects for uh, communities and, and families. Right. And I know it is, there's a, a new initiative, Connectio, which they're looking at also the connectivity with our digital world, also being as essential as the roads and sewers that you mentioned. So it is particularly we saw over the past year again, that was, I think, compensating and helping us to deal with the isolation, the loneliness, and never, never mind online learning and work. It was definitely um, critical. So you have definitely, as we've talked about, um, touched upon uh, in a challenging time. You seem to embrace it. Um, I know that it was not easy. We're still, we're still taking measures, but some of some of the initiatives that you implemented to deal with the pandemic, things such as more hiring, things such as increased inspections in order to keep the industry safe. Um, could you give us a peek into what those measures were and you know how critical and then how successful they were? I think they were tremendously successful. Yeah, really a great, great question. Um, uh, as of uh, today, you know, we've done about 45,000 workplace uh, inspections and it's growing uh, literally by hundreds uh, every single week. Um, we did bring on uh, more than 100 actually new Ministry of Labour Training and Skills Development uh, inspectors. So it's actually the largest uh, amount of inspectorate in uh, Ontario history. But then we've also partnered together with other ministries to bring over um, other uh, inspectors and provincial offences officers really to go out and you know educate uh, employers, managers, supervisors, and workers on on the protocols to prevent COVID-19 from coming in uh, to workplaces or onto construction job sites. Right. Just one story I, I want to share. I remember when the pandemic first hit Ontario, there were uh, all kinds of uh, voices saying that we should be uh, shutting down construction. And I thought, you know, there has to be a better way because there's 550,000 women and men uh, who work in, in construction every day in Ontario. So I picked up the phone, called the industry leaders, uh, called uh, labor leaders and, and called workers and said, how can we you know, work together to keep uh, workers safe every day and keep sites open? And uh, the first uh, guidance documents or guidelines that we issued uh, were for construction sites. So I think that's a shining example of working together and all in all, I mean, 151 uh, cases of COVID have been found on construction sites out of 550,000 workers. So it's a, a decent track record. And uh, again, we just got to remain vigilant. Very decent. Yeah, absolutely. And I, 
personally, I think I speak on behalf of many when we want to thank you for being champions of the construction industry and doing your part to keep us safe. And we know that construction is actually a vit vital to the economic recovery of our city. So, so thank you from from all of us. I think really and. Um, you know, when you're immersed in it, like you said, sometimes you have to draw awareness to the education, right? Because you can lose sight, but it becomes your norm. So a heightened awareness and education is, uh, I agree, a great step towards safety. Um, you're also doing important work for the skilled trades in terms of promoting that as a career. I know you speak very often about what a rewarding and lucrative career that can be, and also encouraging women to join the skilled trades, which I, for one, am, am very pleased with and excited about. It's um, you know, I, I know there's uh, there's something like a hashtag move over Bob, Bob the Builder. There's now room for women and uh, I'm excited about it. And I wanted to hear your thoughts on how that's going and and, you know, really how rewarding it could be. Absolutely. And Andrea, just a, a shout out to you for all the leadership. I mean, I've been with you. I remember the, the Bolt Charitable uh, Foundation event. I mean, we were talking about it there. And just to see those young faces at George Brown that day, uh, people from all across Canada, uh, picking up uh, a career in the trades and, and getting a chance to try the trades. Uh, I'm really passionate about this. I mean, these are uh, well-paying jobs. They're meaningful. Uh, people can have pride uh, in the work that they do. They get to see what they've built. And uh, again, I, I really think that we have to spread opportunity more widely and fairly. And a career in the skilled trades uh, does just that. I remember prior to COVID-19, every single day, 200,000 jobs are going unfilled uh, in Ontario. That actually hasn't changed that much. Many of those are in the skilled trades. So there's hope and opportunity out there for everyone. One of the uh, things that I'm most proud of, we're investing uh, record amounts in pre-apprenticeship programs. So this gives uh, you know young women and people from at-risk communities and Indigenous uh, communities, uh, opportunities to try the trades for 12 weeks. I just want to tell you a short story. Uh, yes. uh, Sunday night, uh, a few weeks ago, I called a lady, a Natisha, who uh, is now an iron worker. And she told me straight out that she was on welfare uh, for uh, several years, came from uh, a challenging at-risk community. She was a single mom with two kids and she tried a pre-apprenticeship program where she got to try all the different skilled trades uh, in construction and she chose to be an iron worker and I called her just two weeks after she graduated and signed on to be a, a journey person she's making over $44 uh, an hour so these are great careers and she kept saying this has changed my life it's life-changing these are the stories that we have to share with with young women young people indigenous communities at-risk communities because it changes her life and and that's the opportunity that's out there. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. The storytelling, the anecdotal information and pieces that we get to hear really make it relatable, achievable. Um, so thank you for sharing that story. It's wonderful. And to work with your hands, like I said at the beginning, is something sometimes you don't get exposure to and it's a missed opportunity. Um, I know I have a son like that that loves to work with his hands and uh, there's just I know people even in our own organization that work on site, I know there's tremendous pride when you can look up and say, I built that, I did that, right? So not many people have that privilege to express that. And I think it's something worth a lot more people investigating and, and considering as a career. Um, I wanted to close our conversation with, I think a little bit of what could be fun for us. And um, I'm gonna ask you a few kind of from the hip rapid fire questions, if you don't mind. This will be uh, this will be good practice for question period. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right, we'll start with three words to describe you. Faith, family, and work. Very good. What is the last thing that you built with your hands? A treehouse. That's an easy one. My uh, seven-year-old daughter and I built a treehouse last year with uh, a neighbor of ours who's a journey person. That's impressive. Okay, I only have a birdhouse to my name, so very good. A treehouse. Finally, well, not finally, there's two more. Um, any regrets? You know that I didn't start um, building things at a younger age. Okay. It's a, it's a recent thing for me. I mean, growing up in the hardware business, selling building supplies, I was really good at, you know, selling things and loading trucks. But, um, 
you know, yeah, you would have thought you would have been building things. I know right? my wife thought that too, and she married me. But it's really <laughs> been the last five years, and I, I wish I started it as a young kid. Well, you're just living proof that it's never too late, right? Exactly. Very good. And finally, I think a message we'd all love to hear is: What do you need people to do to make you successful as a minister? How can we help? Come home safely after a hard day's work. That's an easy one. Thank you very much. I think that's. Um, words of wisdom and something we can never take for granted. Uh, Minister McNaughton, we really appreciate you taking the time. We'd like to thank you for joining us today and all the great work you're doing in the province to, to, to support healthy, safe workplaces. And thank you to everyone else for joining us today. I'm sure it was delightful to hear Minister McNaughton and make sure to join us again next time for more dialogue and insights. Thank you. <laughs>